pages. Okay, I start with this one. Yeah. Does it work? It does. Okay. So we do have two titles, one which we came up with and one which Irka came up with. And he thought his one is better, so he used it. And I'll show you also the other one. And uh, because what we want to show you today is that it's actually a completely new field, which you, you can have lectures about AlphaFold, which would be semester lectures. And uh, to give an outline, what we want to talk about is uh, protein structure prediction in general, how this was changed by uh, competition that measures the success of this prediction. Then we will talk about how, briefly about how AlphaFold works. And then we will show what has been done with it over the last uh, less than two years. And uh, mainly we will talk about the limitations as they were seen at the beginning and what, has, uh, what is still a limitation, what, what is not limitation anymore. And we will at the end uh, talk about the next cusp, which is just behind the corner. So um, it was the 13 November 2020. That's one of these days like the 9-11, right? Do you remember what you did when you heard about the success of uh, AlphaFold? And there were these bombastic uh, titles, like it will change everything and the game has changed. And there was a very personal note by Professor Mould, who is the the leading figure in, in CASP, who said that we were been stuck on this problem for 50 years. And now it looks like it has been solved. And uh, when, I, when I read this one, it reminded me the, the titles when the human genome was finished. And they were also so bombastic. And just, just yesterday, you've probably seen it, it was again finished, so I just showed this one. Sorry, that's a detour, but you probably know these two uh, uh, pages, which were when the genome was finished in 2001. Then it was finished in 2004. Then it was again finished in 2006. And they already say that again, because it was a bit... Uh, embarrassing, but it has been finished again uh, uh, yesterday, but not so much. You see, they already say filling the gaps, and it's everything, really. Now, it's really everything except the Y chromosome. And <laughs> the, because, because the genome they have, the, the cell line they have sequenced was uh, coming from females, so we have just two eggs. There's nothing from Y chromosome, but they have it. So just wait for it. There will be another Nature paper really soon when they will finish also the Y chromosome. And then we will see what will happen and how many more you can get. It reminds me like when these uh, athletes jump over the board just two centimeters no more. They know they can jump five, but why would they do it? It's better to have three world records than just one. So, so let's see how this will work out with the alpha fold, right? Uh, I, yeah, so it, <laughs> I think talking here about protein structure, uh, it uh, doesn't need much introduction. We know that uh, knowing structure helps in many aspects. There is the structure of uh, uh, BCRI able kinase with imatinib helps to uh, produce new. Uh, drugs that can probably bind better and work against the resistance. We have like these huge, beautiful complexes of, sorry, uh, that should have worked in turn, but it doesn't, of uh, F F1, F0, FTPAs, where uh, you can see all the intricacies of uh, how such a simple thing as producing ATP can be very difficult to do. And having structures is fine, but it's really difficult to get them. And it's also not only difficult, but also expensive. So if you look how many sequences we have, and this is in millions and this is in thousands. So then the gap between the known sequences and known structure is growing really fast. And there is no stop to this. So we have 300 million sequences in Uniprot. And just about now the n number is like 200,000 experimentally sold structures. So it would be nice to do it some other way, right? Knowing structure is useful, but doing it experimentally is just too slow. So uh, maybe it could be done from the sequence. And we know this for a very long time. In 1972, there was a Nobel Prize for Christian Anfinsen, uh, who showed that uh, 
on this ribonucleotide reductase that if you put it in, in the denaturation conditions and then put it back, it can get the conformation uh, back and it's working almost 100% the efficacy of the enzyme. And from that he came to conclusion that native conformation is determined by the totality of interatomic interactions and hence by the amino acid sequence in a given environment. So in principle, if we have sequence, we should be able to know the structure uh, or predict the structure. And so since then, people are trying to do this. That's why, why Mould said that it's 50 years endeavor. And the, the first approach is where, okay, it will be probably the lowest energy. So people are looking uh, what could be the lowest energy for this sequence. And this has worked to only a very limited degree. And then in 2012, 2014, people came with this uh, uh, evolutionary approaches when they look for correlated sequences in, in huge alignments. We needed to have a lot of uh, sequences first, but when we had them, we could see that if this position three is changing, it's also position, I don't know, 11 is changing. And the interpretation is that they are probably in contact. And if you have strong alignments, you can find enough contacts in, in this to build the initial uh, idea how the structure could look like, and then this can be probably uh, improved by, by energy methods. So this, this was the state of the field, and the state of the field was uh, uh, monitored by a competition which was called CASP. It's Critical Assessment of Protein Structure Prediction. It runs every two years since 1994. And it, it's very nice idea, very simple idea. People who have almost finished the experimental structure, but they have not deposited it, will send the sequence of this structure and give some time to modelers to do their predictions. And then these predictions are confronted with the already deposited structures half a year later. And so you can say which are working and which are not. It, it's more difficult than as I described it. Uh, they have developed a lot of metrics to say whether they are similar to experimentally so structures or not. And the one which is now used most is so-called global distance test, total score, which is just sum of number of atoms which fall within when you align the experimentally so structure and the uh, uh, predicted structure number of atoms which are within a certain distance range. And here on this plot, you see the history of CASP. And uh, on this is the higher the number is, the, the better is the prediction. And then on the x-axis is how difficult it is uh, to pr predict this protein. The difficulty is mostly done by sequence identity to any known pr protein structure. And you see that if the structure was not known for uh, many years, the, the success was not very big. If the GDTTS is below 50, then basically even the overall shape is not correct. So it doesn't look much similar to what, what, the, what the experimental structure looked like. And there was some incremental progress, but it was not very big. And then AlphaFold came to work, and then the first version was in 2018, and it was, it was in many ways shock. The first shock was that it was the first private company joining the competition. Before, there were always academic labs working, and then all of a sudden, private company uh, DeepMind, which is now owned by Google, and at that time it was already, I think, owned by Google, uh, said we will, we, will, we will try it as well. And you see that the, the progress was already very significant. And that was in 2018. And then two years later, they tried again. And they moved from here to here. So they basically crashed the field. What is, but also interesting, and it also shows the strength of the competition, that this green light, green line, are all the other methods, the average of all the other methods. So they were here two years back. And they jumped like this because the ideas were known 
they could use them and they are teaching from each other. So even they, they were much better than the alpha fold two years back. So, so the progress is, is seen and the individual circles are the individual predicted structures and some of them are almost 100%. So they're, they're literally the same as the experimentally so structure. So, so this way they, they showed that alpha fold can really do the predictions and but how does it look like if you look at the one of the better predictions uh, you see it doesn't matter whether the green one is the experimentally solved or the or the blue one right but you see that it's basically the same few side chains are slightly different but even the side chains very often have almost the same conformation and if you look so this is one of the best ones and if you look on the on the the worst one actually, which they did, is this one, and this they, they had I think two which had this GDTTS score worse than 50. This one is the lowest, and I said it, it's not much similar, but in this case it's even still there is some resemblance at least. I think for certain things it could be useful. Uh, so, and again. Once more, the side chains, it can often predict correctly even the side chain. So there was ORF from COVID-19, ORF8, which was one of these enigmatic uh, genes. Not, not much was known for it. And again, this one, this plot shows individual methods, and it shows how much better alpha fold is from the rest of the pack, at least on this protein. So... Um, we got these results, but didn't, we didn't know what it does, and I think, and how does it do it? And I think Karel will tell you now how it, how it works. Where's the trick? So, uh, let's continue about what's under the hood of AlphaFold 2. Uh, it uh, basically only takes, the, as an input, only the protein sequence, nothing else, and the rest is basically pre-calculated within the program itself. So it takes uh, the genetic databases to confirm the multiple sequence alignment, and also uh, it takes the structural, structural templates from the PDB. Uh, and these two uh, strains of information are then combined together in the uh, Evoformer module, which basically tries to learn the interactions and how the multiple sequence alignment can learn from the structure and vice versa. And these are later on used for the structure module, which basically builds the structure for that specific sequence and generate uh, the structure together with some kind of a confidence score. And this confidence score is really good in that way that it gives the information about the confidence and the structure, uh, the high confidence parts, are actually scrambled back into the beginning, and then uh, this uh, cycle is going on again and again. So the multiple sequence alignment is uh, using basically standard tools uh, like Jackhammer or HHBlitz, and it uses the classical UNIREF90 and UNICLAST30 sequence databases. But it also takes much larger uh, databases like a big fantastic database, PFD, or Magnify database, which are really, uh, really big. And uh, for individual proteins, the, during the paper, they were able to show that in order to model the structure properly with AlphaFold, you need at least 30 sequences aligned for that specific sequence. Otherwise, the quality is deteriorating. Yeah? So here is basically that 30, and above that it's almost the same, but below that uh, you are getting much lower, uh, lower quality of the structure at the end. So uh, for the training of the algorithm, uh, because it's machine learning, so we need to train it somehow, uh, there are the first uh, generated uh, uh, structures from the PDB, uh, 70 clusters, so the structures which are 70% identical to each other. And uh, then this is actually uh, enhanced by predicting the additional uh, 350,000 structures from UNIREF. And 
this generates a, uh, some structures with the high and low uh, quality. And those with high quality are again scrambled back and then trained again uh, in order to make the, the data more richer, even for those structures, uh, even for those sequences where we don't have the structure in the PDB itself. And then there are additional, uh, additional uh, deep learning uh, use, uh, methods like BERT, which are trying to mutate it and generate the, uh, to, to gather, the, to even more enrich the, uh, the data. As I've said, Evo former module uh, basically scrambles both information, so from the structure and from the sequences, and it goes uh, first working on the sequences, uh, by looking not only on pairs, as were used previously for covariance, uh, uh, as uh, Marianne was showing, that uh, previous methods were basically looking into pairs of uh, residues which were covariantly mutated all over the uh, multiple sequence alignment. In this case, there are triplets. And uh, since we have triplets here, there can be uh, basically looking into a different base how to check this information, whether as this covariance is valid or not. Because we have this, ha here a triangle inequality to help us with the uh, looking into the edges, and those edges should be interacting to each other. So that's that's additional thing which was not present in the previous method. And this, uh, this information from multiple sequence alignment is then put to train uh, uh, the pairs uh, within the structural information. So that generates the single representation and uh, the individual pairs for the structures. And those are coming into the protein structure module. The structure module, at the end, does not recognize that there is something like a big bone. Right? But instead, it takes all amino acids as uh, points in the 3D structure, without any connections to each other, something like a residue gas. And within that gas, uh, it basically gives us the individual interconnections between individual amino acids, and those amino acids are, after that, later, connect it in order to make the backbone. And this backbone is afterwards refined with uh, Umbra SB, uh, 99 SB4 spilled. So quite stay standard in the field as well. So uh, this uh, technique, which basically gives us first the positions of these individual amino acids and only later connects them in order to make a protein chain, uh, oversteps the problem that oftentimes happens when you have uh, first the template and then you are not able to go beyond the, what the original template is showing, yeah? like in the template model. So uh, the funny part about the, uh, about the alpha fold is that it generally, and in that uh, original version, uh, was generating just monomers. Uh, but those monomers were oftentimes quite okay, even if they were part of complexes, as uh, is in this case of uh, some filament. And you can see that uh, basically the, the comparison between the positions is quite good, even for this one molecule. Because the information which is stored into into the, inside the multiple sequence alignment is basically giving us this information about the relative positions. So that the next step in the development of AlphaFold was that uh, they got connected, DeepMind got connected with PDBE, and uh, they together used the AlphaFold in order to generate the, uh, the database of all proteins, and they, they, they are trying to, to generate as much protein structures as possible, and they've started with 20 uh, proteomes of the model organisms. And they've put it uh, in public domain under the AlphaFold database. You can quite nicely find it in alphafold.ebi.ac.uk. 
And here, uh, you basically can found the complete structures of multiple proteomes. I'm not showing all, uh, because they are not. Uh, they started with uh, 20 model organisms, like a human. Uh, then they've added uh, the global health proteomes for different uh, parasites and, and uh, bacteria. And finally, they've added uh, the prediction files for all structures from SwissProt. So those structures which were in the uh, curated database within the Uniprot, uh, they are now made as well. Uh, so how the results look like? The individual pages for individual structures uh, can be found out by Uniprot ID or by looking for the keyword. And uh, as in this case, CNV uh, domain containing protein 1. And the structure is shown in a, a Molstar viewer uh, from Brno. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, structure is colored by the quality and confidence score. And as, as I said, this, that confidence score is quite important for the, how good the structures are and what can we later on uh, do with those, uh, with those structures. And here we can see that, for instance, this alpha helix is quite nicely covered. And if there are some blue, so slightly uh, cyan uh, colored uh, parts, those are usually quite uh, satisfactory as well, but they are moving usually. And as we are moving towards the yellow and red, those parts are moving quite, uh, quite a lot. And it gives you, uh, the alpha fold also gives you the information about how those individual uh, amino acids are interacting to each other. So based on this structure, we can say that this part, which is represented here, is in uh, this, uh, the relative interactions between these ones are, is okay all over the place. But the relative interactions between this part and this helix, which is probably this, this part here, uh, there is no confidence at all, so the, the relative uh, conformation, uh, relative position of this one versus this one is not completely settled. Right. So this is again quite a nice piece of information gi which gives us the information about the validity of individual model. And the question is, how good are the models uh, in the proteomes? And uh, if you look into the quality of confidence score within the resolved structures, which, is, which are in the PDB, we not surprisingly see that major, complete majority of them have really high confidence score. Of course, there are several which doesn't have the, the highest number of confidence score, but it actually makes sense because some parts are actually movable and uh, uh, alpha fold in general just predict one structure. So if you have multiple conformers, it just boils down into one structure. I will speak about it a little bit later. And these are usually those parts of the structures which are moving. Uh, when, we, uh, when the unresolved part of human protein was, was analyzed, there is, <laughs> on the other hand, a huge amount of the uh, structures which does not have really a high confidence, which again makes sense because these are so far unresolved structures and they are unresolved for a reason, because they are moving a lot. And if we take all of the human, we can say that basically we are from 60% we are resolved, at least our proteins are. Uh, or a static one. Uh, but one needs to be careful. Uh, if you put, the, for instance, this, this example, uh, and that's the putative human cytochrome P452C7, uh, there you will find two, uh, two structures for a, for a human, and uh, based on their uh, typical, uh, typical Uniprot ID, you cannot basically tell which one is, is, the, the, is the right one. And uh, only when we are, when, when you look afterwards into the sequences, you can find out, okay, the reason why this one seems like a typical other cytochrome P450 
is only because the other structure is uh, not complete. Uh, and there is quite a lot of huge gaps in the structure. So the structure can be only as good as your sequence is. And also another problem is that the AlphaFold database contains monomers. And here I have a uh, here I have another example from uh, from my past work, and that's the uh, uh, mycoplasma uh, tuberculosis uh, ATP synthase, for which we are trying to develop some uh, new compounds. And here, uh, this uh, this structure is unavailable in the PDB itself, but because we have alpha fold, we can look now into uh, this structure as it is. And uh, therefore, I've downloaded the, uh, the uh, alpha fold models for three different uh, uh, sequences which were annotated for this one, uh, depending on the, on the individual strains of uh, mycoplasma tuberculosis. And you can see that if I overlay it over the uh, mycoplasma spagnatis ATP synthase, it does not fit. Yeah. While it, when I've just used the, co co the typical uh, tool from the past, Swiss model, which were using just a uh, template mode, uh, homology modeling with the quite nice template of uh, Mycoplasma magnatis, it really nicely followed the way, and I was able to find out that the, basically with the binding site, I, I'm modeling quite nicely, and we were able to confirm the experimental results of our colleagues. So a word of caution, even though in most cases the alpha fold is quite nice, alpha fold DB contains only the monomers. And not always the information about the complex as it is will be completely, uh, completely valid also for the complex. So now the question where you can run the alpha fold in your own, because AlphaFold database is nice. The good thing is that someone already calculated those structures, so you don't have to. Uh, but uh, still, there are proteins for which you want to play. So first option uh, was that the, uh, the whole AlphaFold is uh, downloadable from GitHub. So you can download it from GitHub. Or on the GitHub, there is actually a collab fold, uh, which was the first, uh, uh, first uh, venue where it was possible to calculate the alpha fold online uh, using your Google account, basically. But the problem is that uh, the limitation is of in the size, and it's quite severe. According to my experiences, when I was trying to model something a little bit bigger, like this uh, structure of uh, whole uh, spike protein, I wasn't able to do that because it's too big. Uh, so there are another ways. Uh, the another way uh, is to use the resources from the Elixir, Czech Republic, uh, where on Metacentrum there are the certain uh, clusters where it's possible to calculate uh, with the alpha fold. And as of yesterday, if I'm not wrong, uh, we even uh, uh, installed, uh, it was even installed at the newest version of AlphaFold 2.2.0, which is also able to uh, make the structures of the multimers. So the complexes are now available here. Uh, the another way, again connected with, uh, with the Elixir check, is uh, to use galaxy.eu which is quite a nice way because basically this, this tool does not ask you for much. It basically asks you, okay, put me here a sequence and it will, try, it will make you the model and it will give you the model even of a dimer, like in, in this case. And here is a dimer of nucleic acid protein from SARS-CoV-2, <coughs> which I've tried to model for our uh, Czech genomic uh, surveillance for, uh, for the COVID. And uh, in this way, I was really struggling to generate the, the proper dimer. And the trick, which I was at the end able to use in this, in this uh, modeling, in order to make the uh, domains which are known from the crystal to, to make some 
really good relative uh, conformation was to basically make a long disordered poly N chain which allowed the structure, which, which retains as an unstructured, but it gives the, the, even the previous version which did not make the multimer, it gives me uh, the opportunity to basically make one long sequence which at the end folded into a dimer. And the only thing is that at the end I need to cut out uh, this, uh, this poly N linker. So, uh, the another possibility is uh, to use uh, ledge, but uh, it's basically the same, uh, it's quite similar to use Galaxy, but it gives you a little bit more of the possibilities for, for setting it up. So, what are the limitations? The alpha fold, as we said, is just a start because the alpha fold ideas were already used for the making up the uh, Rosetta fold, uh, uh, the prediction of pro process protein, and there were multiple tools already which were using the alpha fold in order to help with the structure determination either by the cryo uh, EM or via the molecular replacement. And here I just put uh, the literature search on the European C, and you can see that there is 530 papers already, which is using the alpha fold somehow. So I'm sorry that we are not showing all of them, or maybe you are lucky that we are not showing all of them, and we should show at least something. So uh, here is one of the such uh, tool uh, which can be used for the determination for, for the molecular replacement where you can use the alpha fold model as a starting point in order to, uh, to make the final crystal structure uh, from the initial, uh, initial start. Yeah. But so since we have alpha fold, are structural bioinformaticians and structural biologic out for the job market? So are we basically useless now? Well, thankfully not yet, because there is plenty of things AlphaFold cannot do. So for instance, AlphaFold cannot do potent mutations because it's working with the large multiple sequence alignment, so it cannot do both point at alignment mutations. It also cannot be used for drug design because we, it's basically you know, looking into this residue gas and therefore it should not be working properly for drug designing. And we, you get a single structure, so no confirmation diversity or dynamics. And uh, it cannot make you the protein complexes unless you use that you know, tube, tuny little tricks. And uh, in the structures, there is not just protein, but post-translational modifications, ligands, some protein sequences, we don't have anything else for them. And it doesn't tell us much about the folding process itself. Or is it? Yeah. And so these were the uh, things which were told that uh, on that November 2020, that these things AlphaFold cannot do. We are two years later, and we will go through all of them, and I will show you that actually now it's possible that these things are already to some level solved. So the first thing, AlphaFold cannot do point mutation effects. So I've looked into a uh, typical case, which I was told by when I was here as a PhD student by my supervisor, Jiri Vondrasek, and that was the fault switching proteins. And that one was in 2009 uh, by Patrick Alexander et al. And uh, what they did was that they found two really similar sequence proteins for which they knew from the structures that one of them is all alpha helix and another one is alpha plus, plus beta. So, quite a huge difference, and they played later on in order to make the sequence as similar as possible, and they were able to look into that one single change, L45 to tyrosine, to make switch from the all alpha to alpha plus beta. So on the right side, 
are my tryings and my own calculations, which I run using the alpha fold this Monday. And uh, you can see that this all alpha with 77% of identity is really nicely covered. Even the, the, the model from all alpha, uh, which has this leucine still here, when I go for the all beta, then I have the same structure as, uh, as was seen here. But here is what, hap what is happening on the, on the edge, on this uh, G beta 98, which should be, according to the Alexander, uh, alpha plus beta. And actually, when alpha fold runs, it gives you several models. And those models, in all 100%, gives you one helix, that's for sure. But those uh, beta uh, sheets uh, depends on where they are, uh, but they, they show up. So it's not completely perfect, but it's close to perfect, I would say. Another thing, alpha fault cannot do drug design. Okay? Actually, 70% uh, <laughs> of the data set where were APO versus hollow structures, the alpha fault was tending to predict hollow proteins, so the protein with a drug. So in that case, it means that the structure from the alpha fault database in 70% can be used for the drug designing because it will cover the ligand and therefore it can lead the drug designing process. Not always, yeah. for instance, in this case, uh, the alpha fold is covering the hollow, so it will give you the, the right binding into the ornithine, even though it does not predict the position of ornithine itself. It only shows the prediction of the amino acids around that spot, which later on gives you the right uh, drug design. But in such ca some cases, it does not give you the, uh, the hollow form, but it gives you the upper form. And it, in that case, you cannot do much yet. But it also gives you the information about the flexibility. Uh, here is the uh, SLC1A5 uh, transporter. And the transporters are able to go from the inward facing to outward facing conformations. So there is quite a huge movement. And this new movement is actually shown by the uh, by that score, PLLDT, the predicted confidence score. Because this predicted confidence score is actually showing that this one helix is actually movable and that it really is. Because it's really changing in this structure according to this one. So it gives you this information uh, that something is at least moving, even though this structure is quite cl closely resembling only the outward facing. So just this November, <laughs> there was a nice paper which actually showed that you can manipulate multiple sequence alignment by deleting the specific pairs, uh, the specific triangles, which are closing one of, those, uh, in one of those conformations, and when you remove them, you get the another one. Okay. So it's possible to play a little with, with the multiple sequence alignment in that way that uh, the, the alpha fold is actually able to show you different conformations, and it will give you the models. And they've even shown that uh, when you start with these crystal structures for this transporter MHP1, it uh, actually is possible to generate the structures, and it actually is able to predict the, the whole pathway about how this transporter moves, even though we have no structure crystallized in this part. So it's quite useful this time. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, this gives us also the information about the possibility to distinct where are the interesting, dis interestingly disordered parts. And those interestingly disordered parts are there show, later on shown as some kind of a long, red, hairy things, 
but their presence and that they are in the structure at that specific spot is covered quite nicely and it was shown that it's actually one of the best predictors for the structural uh, for uh, interestingly disordered mess of that structure. And now I will hand over back to Marianne, who will give you more information about it. Okay. Um, so so that, that, that was one of the fascinating things. You train the program to predict structures, gl globular well-defined structures, but it actually also predicts the disordered structures the best possible way we have at the moment, although it wasn't trained for it at all. But if you look more carefully, you will find out that you, we, we have certain tools to predict disordered proteins, and it says that in human, about 30% of residues are these disordered residues. So if you take this state-of-the-art tool, predict which residues should be disordered, and then you look at the confidence score of alpha fold, you will find out that about 15% of those are, have very high score, over 90 even. And if, if you look at them, so here are the examples. This is experimentally so structured. This is alpha fold prediction. This bit looks like nice disordered region. This is not so much. But when they look at them, it turned out that 60% of those with very high score are those which are conditionally disordered. So they, it seems that it not only can predict whether they are disordered, but also whether they can change conformation upon some interaction with something. So th this was another quite interesting thing. And this is, this is, these papers we will show now are mostly, I have to say, preprints and coming from February, March this year. There's an awful lot of things happening. So disorder uh, can be also very well conserved and can have very high score. And then this confidence score seems to be the most uh, miraculous thing about AlphaFold because it is used in so many ways. And another one is that it can be used to predict uh, multi-protein complexes. I, Karel didn't say this thing with the multimer correctly. The multimer is installed on on Metacentrum for, from the start. Actually, we got an echo from DeepMind that it's ready, so next day it was working. But the Multimer at the beginning faced a lot of uh, criticism for not doing interfaces between uh, the, the individual subunits well. And this is an example of, of one such case. There were, ver there were very many of those. And uh, Multimer works, still the idea is the same, you just put the other chain at the end of the sequence. And you might put the linker, they now say that the linker has to be really long, like 200 amino acids, that seems to work almost always. And so you have one sequence 200 times x and then another sequence, and you treat it as one sequence. The multimer cannot do really huge complexes, so it can do dimer, trimers, maybe tetramers, but not, not more. But it has been, they, 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 at DeepMind, they read this criticism, and just two weeks ago, they released a new version of multimer, which now is installed since, I think, yesterday on, on Metacentrum, which should, which should help with these interface clashes. So this is the old one, this is the new one. So this new multimer can do this much better. And you see here overlay of number of crystal structures of similar proteins, which where, where they show how this interface should, like, should look like. And that's how it looks like in the alpha fold now after they improve it just two weeks ago. So this uh, st steric clashes on the interfaces should be gone mostly. So they have retrained everything and they have a very new model for this. Yeah, and yeah, so it was 20, no, sorry, 10, so three weeks ago when they released the new version. It's also an interesting thing when we talk to people from DeepMind, they said that they will not publish papers anymore. They are not interested in that fighting with nature. They said this was one of the worst experience in their life. So when they will do things, they will do it only on bioarchive. So we cannot expect that this will ever be published as such through peer review. They said this is this is working for them, and they will. If they do this, they they will get their uh, extra money for for doing this, even without it. Uh, in nature. And uh, 
people work with uh, AlphaFold Multimer on various levels. Karel already mentioned that you can do quite a lot by changing uh, multiple sequence alignment. And these are two works from Arne Elofsson from Stockholm University. In one, he shows that he can very well, using, using the confidence score from AlphaFold again, he can transform it in some docking score for the, for the multimers and find which poses are the correct ones. And the, the trick here is by again, a very simple thing. They, they say uh, they do paired multiple sequence alignment, and then they say which two sequences are from the same, uh, should form the, should form the multimer. And they also try to do even more ambitious things when, when you have multimer dimer or trimer, you can again use the, these scores for them to build, to distinguish the, the higher order uh, structures. So they tried here from 10 to 60 subunits. And it also, the score can tell you whether it's complete or not, whether this structure is already final or not, and they can distinguish quite well among those. So they can, they can build literally any complex now if, if they have enough resources. And there was this criticism about post-translational modifications. Of course, they play an important role. And that's the thing with the AlphaFold database. You get a monomer. There is nothing in there. And all these things are, of course, important. But they, uh, as Karel mentioned, most of the structures are in the holoform predicted. So someone said, OK, maybe there would be space um, preformed for the glycans. So they, they developed a tool which is just trying to put glycans in these empty spaces. And indeed, in certain cases, they can predict the uh, glycan structure quite well. You even see that it moves the side chain in the structure to make space. And it's, again, overlay with the crystal structure. We, we looked ourselves at the protein phosphorylations, and we see the same thing as, as the Apoholo. We see that most of the structures which are predicted are the predicted with the phosphate, at, like with the more, more similar to the phosphorylated structure than the unphosphorylated structure. So again, this would be probably possible uh, to, to predict it inside. And someone says, OK, that would be very easy to fill the ligands in if you have the information, uh, use it. And there is alpha fill now. You put, you just need Uniprot code, and it would add you all the ligands that could possibly be in it based on the experimental structures. And you can switch on and off which one you want to see. Uh, it shows you from which structure it goes, and it shows you the details of interactions on the alpha fold model. So all this is, is, is already done. And <laughs> here's the last one. We, we, we will stop soon, don't worry. This one is about the folding process. And OK, we have to show something which, which really doesn't work, right? So um, they, there was a work that from February this year from Charlotte Dean group in Oxford when they looked at the various uh, these structure prediction tools, including AlphaFold. It is not in this table because it is not as open as it seems. They, if, if you want to get the trajectories for the folding, you need to retrain the model each time for each protein. And that's just not uh, the, the deep mind can do it but not, not normal academic lab. They, <laughs> they said that uh, in DeepMind, they have this um, environmental friendly environment, so they can't use anything plastic and so on. But they said when they want to try to test the new model, they have to switch on a, a power plant in Northern England to run it, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so they have a lot of space to save energy. Uh, but um, they provided some results for them, but they are basically the same as for the other methods. It shows, um, so that's one way to show how well it does, that if you know the intermediates and their structures, you can check how often it carefully or well describes the intermediate interactions. And 
these tools, they do it worse, all of them, they do it worse than flipping the coin. So there is no similarity between the intermediates in the alpha fold and, and the experimental structures so far. There is one which is marginally better, but uh, it still can't do it. And uh, they, they had two other measures which showed basically the same thing. They cannot, they cannot show how this folding goes. Uh, but there's but to everything. There's a, there's a new paper which came out this month, which basically says no uh, alpha fold uh, can, can learn the energetical function and it does work. And that's from the group of Sergei Ovchinnikov, that's one of the guys who made the alpha fold public by this collab thing. And uh, so there seems to be discrepancy, but in a way it's, it's not so different. So what they say is, if, if, I, if Anfinsen was right, then it should really, you don't really need the evolutionary information. In the cell, there are no 50 related sequences to guide the process. It should be possible to do it with one sequence alone. And uh, if they try it, uh, so they would say, we don't need the evolutionary data, the, or the, the sequence part of the prediction. The, the models are not really good. You, you see that the, this, uh, it's not exactly the GDTT as I was talking about, but it's, it's sort of similar. But if you give them some structural information, it, then it depends how good is the structural information they get. If, if it's good, uh, then they basically don't need the evolutionary information. If it's, if it's uh, average, then it is better than without, without having uh, evolutionary information at all, but it's not very good. And that's what they say is that uh, this evolutionary information is used to find the global solution, and then AlphaFold according to them, indeed learn some energetical function and can do this bit, can then find the, the details, but it cannot find the, the global minima, as, as of now at least. So that's, that's the state of uh, a week ago. So we will see what will happen, what will happen next week. So, so just, just to summarize, AlphaFold definitely is a huge leap in the prediction and also in the field of structural biology. And uh, what we haven't talked so much about, but is that the role of open science and, and even people from DeepMind acknowledge it at every single time that if they wouldn't have PDB as, open P F as an open source of data, they couldn't do it. Uh, it's a major role of this CASP competition because it, it leads the way it shows what works and what doesn't work. And it also, for them, it was crucial because they had these uh, milestones that it should be useful. That's why they did it. And it should be possible to sh show that it works. And if you don't have this competition, then it's difficult to say that it's better than something else. So they were happy that such a thing exists, and that's why they joined. And you can use now AlphaFold on many different uh, platforms. This call-up you can even use on uh, in, in Chimera. There is plugin now which which will start the alpha fold, but only on the call-up. So it it really there are limitations on the size. And Karel mentioned his his uh, S protein, but it will really crash if you have 500 amino acids. It, it will never finish. So it, it the, the limitations are quite severe. You, then you have to go to to Metacentrum or something uh, less friendly but uh, more powerful. And AlphaFold now is, is just a, a flood of new tools using AlphaFold in one way or another. And uh, it seems that a lot of the limits as they were presented at the start, even from people from DeepMind, are not so big limits as they seem to be. But like things like uh, folding still, still hold. So we will see for how long. And uh, hopefully we showed you that it's a, it, it is an important tool and there's a lot of excitement and, and promise from, from using this. So that's with this, I think this is the end, right, Karel? No, it's not. There is a, there is CASP is back. Uh, CASP actually on Monday 
they they start the registration. So if you want to be better than AlphaFold, it's time to it's time to join. And on on the fourth of April, they start the registration. And at the end of May, you will get the sequences, and you can show what you can do. And it's also, again somewhere in November, late November, there will be results. I asked this friend from from DeepMind whether uh, whether they are joining because he said in the autumn that they are not sure they will be joining. There, there is not much for them to show that uh, anymore. But Casp has introduced new category. Uh, they they do much better now the multimer complexes, and they will do RNA this year prediction. And I asked him whether they will join, and he said. The official statement from DeepMind is that we cannot tell, <laughs> and and I have to hold it. That's what he told me. But he said perhaps we can discuss it in more detail at the CASP conference, which is probably telling you the answer to the question. So, so this is really the last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Marianne, for, for the lecture. If you have some questions, so I think the now is the right time. Martin. So great talk, great science uh, behind also. Uh, ep ah. uh, thank you. Great talk and great science behind. Uh, so uh, you showed this uh, monomer AlphaFold database. So with uh, some new versions of uh, AlphaFold, uh, do they plan to rerun it every time? And second question is uh, whether such a similar database uh, is going to happen for, for multimers as well. Are you taking it or shall I? OK. Uh, as far as I understand, no. They will have just the monomer. But they will try to include a lot of information which is not there at the moment about the ligands, about the actual biological unit. And whether they will rerun it, I don't know. But I know that their plan is to have everything. So, so in a year or two, the whole Unipro should be covered. You will not have to worry about doing alpha fold yourself for monomers. But you see that there is a whole range of things which you still want to do otherwise. Question about some concrete examples. So for instance, HIV reverse transcriptase, it's a dimer the same amino acid sequence and two subunits are different. So whether AlphaFold is studying concrete examples and retrospectively learns how to predict that heterogeneity in the, in the dimer. This is one question. And the other one, uh, you refer to empirical data as your, your guiding principle, how, how closely you match the, the real, so-called real structure, but sometimes People in the field describe sort of artifacts of crystal packings. That actually yeah. the structure is uh, one example I, I have been involved in, in, in is uh, hepatitis C virus protease, where actually one uh, sort of alpha alpha chain goes into the other because it's somehow energetically more favorable, but physiologically it's irrelevant. It's really an artifact. And how does alpha fold deal with those things? Do you want to answer? Uh, OK, I can answer it. Uh, so concerning the crystal context, that's this is a good one. Uh, they already at the beginning, there was discussion if you have such a close similarity between the alpha fold and, and Rengen crystallography, uh, which one is the correct one? And they even say it, it's more likely to be alpha fold in many cases. And this crystal context uh, and packing I think it's still a big unresolved thing in structural biology, as I understand it. I always try to, they, in PDB, they now say this is the biological unit, but they don't really know. The, 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 they can, the, there are tools which can predict whether the contact is crystal or not, but there are so many border cases that I, I think this will be the cases when alpha fold can be also very useful, but I haven't seen anything about crystal contacts and alpha fold, did you? Uh, not yet, but uh, I see. Uh, I found out the crystal crystal packing uh, artifact uh, in AlphaFold, which was not there. 
because in case of cytochrome P450s, there is one structure which suffers from the same problem that two uh, monomers are correct contacting because of the crystal packing, which is completely unphysiological. And uh, the alpha fold structure is without this, this problem. So it gives you the right answer. Is actually more relevant, the alcohol yep. predictions more relevant than, than, the the than the crystal structure. In this, in this particular case, yeah, yes. Yeah. I feel we forgot about the first question, and I don't know what it was. About the first question, it was about the, whether the... the reverse transcriptase, it's in identical amino acid sequence, in, in, and the only difference is there were two multi-domain sort of units, and the last domain, ribonucleosage, is chopped off in one of them as a heterodimer, mm -hmm. and those identical amino acid sequences have different conformation. One is active uh, in terms of uh, doing the, the reaction, and the other subunit serves a structural role. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a different structure. So I, I, just as a matter of interest, how would alpha fold deal with that? You have well, two conformations of an ident identical, at least stretch of significant stretch, like 500 amino but we are saying that the amino acid sequences of those two dimers are different. No, no, no. It's identical, but there are two conformations of the identical amino acid sequence mm -hmm. in one uh, dimer, which is physiological in this uh -huh. case. But is this... Uh, you, I, it, I think it needs to be tested. Contact. It needs mm -hmm. to be tested. I but I think, Carol, that's the thing which you showed. If, if, you, if you would... Uh, Modify the alignment. We are more likely to find both conformations. Yeah. So yeah. there are there are tricks to to work with the alignment, which might reveal if there is more conformation than just one. Yeah. But normally it would do ju just one. No, uh, the question is whether one can uh, make an exercise whether alpha fold would, after learning curve, predict how those two units would actually form this heterodimer. Or, or not. You know, it's, uh, it, for me, it would be very difficult to imagine, but I'm just testing the capabilities of, of your approach. Yeah, like so if you will generate the two different conformations of the same protein, so then you can try to multimer, to try to different complexes, yeah. and the score it by the energy, so then you can find which is the best. And it's probably the best one is that heterogeneous you just described, better than the homodimer which will be the same. But you need to know that you want to try it. it. It just doesn't mix proteins randomly. You just have to tell him this too, I want to try. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Okay. <laughs> Again, thanks for the talk. Um, you talk a lot about the residue-based confidence score and uh, that you can estimate that the residue is moving relative to the structure. I would like to know how the, if you, if you know how the score is calculated and how are you making the leap from, okay, the score is below that threshold, so it's moving. Thank you. Okay, okay. So, so I, I can't say I understand it completely, but they say that they have special training for this and they when they do the prediction they look around the residue on the on the characteristics and they train again from experimentally verified structures how the environment should look like and if it's similar then it gets a high score if it's not so similar then it gets a lower score so they have extra machine learning process which learns to score the the local quality and it's, it's again learned from experimentally so structures. And according and to the validity about what uh, score actually means the thing is moving, it's basically visible in, the st in those structures uh, according to the colors that are there currently. Because if I look into the structure in PDB, uh, in AlphaFold DB, and it's completely dark blue, then it wouldn't move a thing in a, a molecular dynamic simulation. But if there will be something as slightly bluish, uh, slightly lighter bluish, then I usually see the movement in the simulation, 
and if there is something completely red, then it's basically moving like hell. So it's just uh, pure sieved. I have no other way how, how to specify and qualify it. More, yeah, more or less, but you, yes, yeah. so, so this 50 threshold is something which you can see you have tools to predict this order. Say, okay, state of the art, this one should be the best we have. And you see that if it's disordered, it hardly ever, except of this 15%, right, goes over 50. So that's how you make the, the border. How much progress do you expect that? Of, oh, okay, let's start from this point of view. In uh, PDB, there are proteins which have ligands like hemes and so on. When alpha fold was trained, those structures were used or they were excluded. That's one thing. And another thing, in the future, let's say, if I have myoglobin structure, will alpha fold will be a, will it be able to predict it and put heme in it? Uh, okay, so the first one is easy. They use them. They, that's also the reason most of the structure nowadays have, have some ligand in it. And they use, they use them all. So that's also why most of the structures which are predicted by alpha fold are more likely to be in hollow form than in upper form. And whether alpha fold will be able to do it, I don't know whether that's the direction they want to go. But there will be other people who will probably do it. At least in alpha fill, it is possible to see uh, the, the addition of the additional ligand into the structure from alpha fold. If the ligand, but nice. the ligand has to be known to be bound. Yeah. yeah. So if it's new one, then it will not show it, right? Yeah, that's true. OK, the last question. Thank you very much for the for the presentation. So I wanted to ask two questions. One of them is whether this presentation will be available anywhere because it seems like a good source of articles and things. And the other one is somewhat related to the uh, to the ligands question. So there are many small proteins that bind metals, for example, which alpha fold is not able to process. Neither is Rosetta, for example. Do you know whether AlphaFold or whether, I don't know, Rosetta or Baker's Lab in general have any plans to do this? And if so, will Rosetta Fold be available on Elixir as well? Uh, well, sure. for the second one, I think, again, the AlphaFill is the answer. Because the metals are part of the AlphaFill because they are taken as cofactors and therefore they are filled inside the structures, out from the similar ones. Uh, 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 no, alpha fill no. In, in alpha fill no. Yeah, but you can use their approach because they they've described how they are doing it. So you can basically use the same type of the approach, basically taking the homology towards something which is similar. And I suppose that in case of metalloproteins, you usually have something similar. And, and, and uh, there was another question, and also uh, whether it could be installed on, on uh, Metacentrum, they would have to ask years here, but I don't think that there is a reason not to do it. That it, yeah. it should be, it, it's available, so there is no reason not to do it. And the presentation, of course, can be available, and we even have a nicer version of the literature list, which we can add at the end, so you can have a look. We haven't talked about quite many, which we found, because that would be just too exhausting. It's uh, not a nice version, but it's a version. A uh, short question. Can alpha field uh, handle covalently bound ligands? I think so, yes. I think him can be seen. We, we could test it quickly, right? That's just... Uh, uh, yeah, at least him are usually there. Yeah, bound to, to that specific pot. So, yeah. If there is no other question, so thank you very much for the listening, and thank you, Marianne and Farrell again for the great lecture. Thank you.